Uh, our speaker today is Robin Dawson from the Medicare Solutions Network. As an independent insurance broker, Robin represents virtually all of the major companies available in Illinois. This empowers her with a unique perspective to share with clients to combat the rising cost of healthcare as we age and navigate the complex world of Medicare with ease. Robin is based on the Northwest side of Chicago and frequently speaks at local libraries, retirement homes, and financial planning offices on the topic of Medicare. And we are very happy to welcome them back. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming out today, everybody. I'm glad we all beat the rain. Um, I will do my best to not trip over one of these cords today, but I like to move around. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, as Jez mentioned, I'm a health insurance agent, okay? But today is not a sales pitch. It's about education. We're gonna break down what I think is a pretty muddy topic into bite-sized chunks, and hopefully you'll get some clarity on a lot of the questions that you might currently have. Whether you're already in Medicare or you're in, about to embark on this journey, there's some good information here that I think is always of value to people as they move throughout the aging process. Because most of us feel like this in Medicare and, and you're not alone and nothing really prepares us for this juncture in our life. You know, the sausage was kind of made behind closed doors, right? And if we had a, had a group plan or a retiree plan or a union plan, something was negotiated on behalf for us and, and given to us to say, take it or leave it. Do you want it? Now you're in the driver's seat and as consumers, you have some decisions to make. And so you really want to understand how some of this works so you can make what I like to call fully informed decisions, okay? So you don't make mistakes that could be very costly for you down the road. So one of the things that I like to do is educate people on their core benefits in Medicare and tell them where some of their most valuable resources are. Because I can appreciate and understand that you might not wanna sit down with an insurance agent like me right away. You wanna do your own research, your own planning, and there's some wonderful government resources and tools that are out there for you. This is the Bible of my industry, the Medicare and you book. Unfortunately, they're not gonna send it to you until you're enrolled in Medicare, but it contains a lot of answers to basic questions that people have before they sign up for Medicare. So my advice would be to go to my second favorite resource, which is medicare.gov. You can download that book on medicare.gov in PDF form under the forms, help and resources tab. All right. And then the new ones published usually in the summertime for the coming calendar year. So it's not going to have all the new Medicare payment amounts for the coming year, but it'll, again, give you some good guidance and advice on things. Um, the other thing that you will find in this Medicare and you book is a lot of, um, a lot of basic answers to coverage questions, right? So like what is covered under Medicare? What isn't covered under Medicare? All the preventative care stuff is listed. It'll also give you some guidance and charts about if you continue to work and continue to have an employer group option and you turn on some part of Medicare, how does that work with your Medicare benefits? Um, the other nice thing in here is that it will give you some guidance around penalties and, and how to avoid them. Um, by enrolling in a timely fashion, all right? One thing I will point out though, is all of the government publications, in print, on the website, over the phone if you talk to somebody, third favorite resource, 1-800-MEDICARE, okay? These things are written for the masses. So just know that each of you in this room has a specific and particular situation that's unique to you, right? So what your friend or your family member shared with you about their experience might be different than yours. You might have one specific circumstance that might change things for you and make your process in Medicare and throughout Medicare very different than those of your closest friends and family members, okay? So read this with, with that broad frame of reference in mind. It's written for the masses, but you know everything has, I like to say Medicare is filled with partial sentences, half truths and floating asterisks, okay? If this, then that occurs, right? So you just have to be mindful of that. On the website, please know that just like Social Security and just like the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, the Medicare website is an address that says .gov, okay? Anything .gov is the federal government resource. If you go to medicare.com, and that does exist, you're going on to a sales site. And if you type in your name and your phone number for a free quote, 
guess what? The minute you hang up or hit enter, your phone's going to start ringing off the hook. If you're about to turn 65, at maybe at 64 and a half, you probably started to see a barrage of email and a barrage of mail fill up your mailbox. Financial planners want to talk to you. Every insurance company on the planet wants to talk to you. Every insurance agent wants to talk to you. They know you're coming, right? And so you're a very highly marketed to and targeted to population of people. And unfortunately, even after you enroll in Medicare and are on your journey, you still get barraged with that mail and that advertising every fall during the Medicare annual enrollment. Okay, so here's the thing, tune out the noise a little bit, okay, do your own research, think about your own circumstance, take a breath, ask yourself some basic questions, which we'll talk about today, and then every year when that mania and noise ratchets up again between October 15th and, the, October 15th and December 7th during the annual enrollment period, you'll know what to do, okay. All right, so what is Medicare? I want to appreciate the fact that there might be some people that aren't in this room that aren't in Medicare yet or that are online today and you're just looking at this for the very first time, okay? Well, Medicare is the health insurance system for seniors in the United States. And what's a senior? Somebody who's 65 and above. So not to be confused with your social security benefits, which have different age trigger points, right? Medicare is 65 and up. Now, there are certain populations of individuals that might qualify for their Medicare benefits a little early, because they have end-stage renal disease, Lou Gehrig, certain health conditions. And so they might come to Medicare at age 50 or you know, 20. Um, but those people have a certain set of circumstances that are allowing that to happen. And they can choose to, to invoke their Medicare benefits at that time or not. And then they'll get kind of a second enrollment period when they turn 65. The one thing that I want everybody to, to really understand here, though, is this last sentence down here. Original Medicare, it's pretty good coverage. And we're going to break it down today so you know exactly what your Part A and Part B will cover for you. But we're also going to talk about what it doesn't cover for you. Because it was never designed to cover everything. There are gaps in your coverage that you're going to want to consider partitioning in other insurance products with. Okay, And we'll talk about what those options might look like. So this is where your journey begins. Now, maybe at age 65, you turn on part A, okay? Sometimes if you continue to work past age 65, and a lot of baby boomers have chosen to do that, right? They like the socialization, they like the work, they like the money, and they work past age 65, but they may turn on their part A benefits when they're first eligible. Why? Because for most Americans, again, not everybody, most Americans, if you've worked 10 years or 40 quarters or your spouse has worked 10 years or 40 quarters and you've contributed into the social security system and payroll deduction with taxes, your Part A benefit has been paid for. So when you turn 65, you can turn it on and it won't have any financial implication for you. It will have no cost, no premium, okay? Now, some people might not want to turn part on Part A if they're contributing to an HSA. Any of these, anybody in here contribute to a health savings account? So health savings account accounts are a nice vehicle because you can kind of stuff them with pre-tax dollars and then you can use them for health care expenses after the fact that are without getting taxed. So a lot of people have HSAs now and those are only, you can only use those if you have a high deductible health plan. Well, turning on any part of Medicare will negate your ability to make further contributions tax-free into those plans. That's why when you're reading the Medicare collateral and publications and you're looking on the website, you'll read things that say, stop contributing to your HSA six months prior to, to turning on Medicare. Why? Because if you wait till 68 or 69 to turn on your Medicare benefits because you've decided to work and just stay on your employer plan, that's fine. But what they're going to do when you go to enroll in your Medicare benefits is they're going to retroactively start just that Part A piece by six months. So if you've made those tax contributions all, all the way up until your last day of work or, or when Medicare starts, you're going to have some taxes to pay back. OK, Part B is the piece that a lot of people, if they continue to work past age 65 and avail themselves of their or their spouse's group coverage, Part B they'll wait on. And, and the reason is because Part B has a monthly premium, and we'll look at that in a bit, okay? But that monthly premium shouldn't be something you start paying for if you're going to continue to stay on group coverage. Why? Because as long as that group coverage is based on an employer plan that has 20 or more people, and it's based on your or your spouse's active work status, 
it is considered creditable coverage in the eyes of the federal government. Creditable meaning you can defer on that Part B piece until a later date without being penalized for late enrollment, okay? But those two things have to exist. The employer has to be over 20 people and you have to be actively working. It cannot be a retiree benefit, okay? If you retired early, let's say you retired at 60, but you know your employer loved you and so they're gonna let you keep their benefits until you're Medicare eligible, that's awesome. But the minute you become Medicare eligible, you have to turn on part A and B that employer plan can maybe be secondary, but it can't be primary anymore, all right? So based on active work status, 20 or more people. Now, everybody gets this seven-month window around their 65th birthday to enroll in Medicare. It's called your initial enrollment window. It actually starts three months before the birthday month, lasts the month you turn 65, and then goes for three more months after. And you can enroll in Medicare at any time in that seven-month window or not. Okay, it's up to you. The government's not going to come looking for you. Some people do, some people don't. Some people just do part A and some people avoid all of it, okay? If you enroll in the three months leading up to your birthday month, your benefits will start the first of the month in which you turn 65, unless, floating asterisk, you're one of the lucky people who has a first of a month birthday. If your birthday lands on the first of a month, you're actually eligible one month prior, okay? So just back up that seven months by one month. Um, if you enroll the month of your birthday, and this is important if you're coming off of group coverage, you've got to time this right. If you're retiring and your birthday is falling somewhere in this seven months, but you know you're going to have group coverage maybe till like here, the thing that you have to remember is in this seven month window, you cannot pick your start date. So depending on which month you apply, that's when your benefits are going to start. So if it's these three months, your benefits start the first of this month. If you wait till your birthday month, part A will start the first of your birthday month. Part B will be pushed out one month. And if you enroll in the three months after your birthday, part A will start the first of the month in which you turn 65, but part B will get further delayed by two and three months after you apply. And I see this happen to everybody kind of around the end of the year. They decide, okay, I'm going to retire now at the end of the year. And it just so happens that their 65th birthday is somewhere in that fourth quarter, right? And they go to enroll and they can't get the start date on January 1st that they want because they, you know, so sometimes you have to have one month overlap. Sometimes you have to just time it right. Okay. So just know that in this window, you can't pick your date. Now, if you wait and you're 69 and you're retiring, and part A is already turned on. Generally, when you put in your part B application into the social security office, they will process that to start the first of the month after you apply, okay? Now, you can designate on the application in a remarks section, I don't want my, let's say you're gonna have group benefits, you, you retire on the second of the month, but you're gonna have group benefits till the end of the month. You can say, I don't want my benefits to start until that following month, right? But you have to notate it, otherwise they're automatically gonna start you the first of the month after you apply, all right? Why do people delay? Well, oh, this just shows the chart. So again, real quick, one month after you turn 65, two months after you sign up, is how it's delayed. And then if you're in the second or third month, it's a three month delay. This is why people will sometimes postpone turning on Medicare Part B, because not only will you have to start paying in calendar year 2020, these are the amounts for 2022, okay? 170 10 per person per month is what it costs for Medicare Part B this year. If however, you are an individual or a joint filer and your modified adjusted gross income falls somewhere in here, you're not gonna pay that 170, you're gonna pay 170 plus some of these other things. Uh oh, I just lost my, oh. Yeah, you're gonna pay these higher amounts, okay? So sometimes when you're looking at a couple breaking over from the plan, this might delay people from wanting to join Medicare. Now, couple things about these, these uh, income adjustments, okay? IRMA is the acronym. It stands for Income Related Monthly Adjustment Amount. When you apply to Medicare in whatever year you apply, for Part B in particular, the Social Security Office is gonna look at the most recent tax return they have on file. So if you apply tomorrow, they're gonna have 2021 returns on file because 2022 really hasn't been processed. They're gonna, that's gonna report your 2021 income, right? Or 20, yeah, 2020. So your modified adjusted gross is the number they're gonna be looking at on that return. 
Now, sometimes people get thrown into other brackets because they had one-time taxable events. Maybe they got a pension payout, maybe a deferred stock contribution payment. Maybe they cashed in part of their 401k because now they're going to buy a home in Florida and snowbird half the year in their retirement. All wonderful things to do, but just know that those taxable events could have a ripple effect on your Medicare premiums going forward. And if Medicare tags you part B as in boy, they're also going to hit you with that income adjustment on part D as in drug, your drug coverage, no matter how you choose to get it. So because drug coverage varies in terms of how much it costs per month, depending on the plan you choose, they're just going to add these flat amounts. All right. So again, just like taxes, the more you make, the more the government takes. Now, these amounts are appealable. So you might say to me, well, Robin, that's not fair because I just retired. I'm not going to be making that kind of money anymore. That's true. So what you can do is you, when you get that letter, that determination notice from Social Security that says, congratulations on earning a decent living, you owe us more for Medicare, you can file appeal. It's, an, it's a single form. They're going to ask for some backup documentation. And you can tell them, listen, I just retired. I mean, what's the worst they can say? No, we don't agree. You have to pay them more until the, your next return show, you know, shows up in our office and tells us that. Or they might agree with you and then right away roll you back a, a level or two, okay? So it's definitely worth the effort to do the appeal. It's, it's not a very onerous process, but you know, they're not gonna pay you back for all the money you paid at a higher rate if later they then find that, oh yeah, that was, you know, they're, now they're retired and they're not making any, that kind of money. So just, you know, be judicious um, when, when that ever happens to you. They look at this on a rolling two-year look back, okay? So they're always kind of checking it and they base it on household income if you're joint filers. So let's break down the parts of Medicare. There are really four parts to Medicare. A and B form the foundation of your coverage, okay? Part A, Medicare refers to as your hospital benefit, but you'll see here in a minute that it covers way more than just hospitalization, okay? Part B, they refer to as your medical benefit. So when you get your letter in the mail that says, you know, congratulations, you, you got your benefits, they, they refer to it as hospital and medical, not part A and part B, but that's what they are, okay? And that's the foundation of your coverage. Again, you may only turn on part of it if you have another source of primary insurance while you're still working or your spouse is still working. Um, the B piece though, once you step off of that, you got to turn it on. Okay. Now there are some individuals that have to turn on part A when they first turn 65. If you've contributed to a pension instead of social security. Okay. Or if you don't have enough tax credits and contribution, those 40 working quarters or 10, you know, 10 years, you might have a premium that you owe for part A. And in that case, you do have to turn it on right away at 65. Okay. Part C, this is a different idea in Medicare. It's a private insurance product that actually takes over for Medicare. And we're going to talk about Part C plans today. But what a Medicare Advantage plan does is it combines your Part A benefit, your Part B benefit, and your Part D prescription drug coverage all in one package of benefits. And it comes in all different flavors and sizes from all kinds of insurance companies. You can get HMOs, you can get PPOs, you can get point of service plans, okay? But most of the time, most people either fall in an HMO or a PPO. But these plans are replacements for Medicare. You still need to have Part A and B turned on, but what happens here is the federal government does a handshake agreement with a private insurance company and says, okay, you guys take care of Robin. You run all of her benefits under Part A, Part B, and Part D. So they can't give you anything less than what you're owed in Medicare, but what they're doing when they collect your Part B premiums is they're passing them over to a private insurance company. And then all the federal tax dollars that trickled into the Medicare system to take care of me and my benefits, because it costs a lot more than 170.10 per person per month to run our benefits in Medicare, those federal tax dollars also go over to that private insurance company. So they're very well funded with taxes and your Medicare premiums, which is why you see these zero premium plans, okay? Who's got a mail piece in their mailbox that said, you get an insurance plan that costs you nothing. And you can see a primary care doctor for no copay. And you can get free dental, free vision, free gym club membership. That's Medicare Advantage, okay? It's not all free. The cost for the insurance might be zero or it might be very low, 
but you will have co-pays for everything you do as you use the healthcare system. So it's more of a pay as you go model, but structurally it gives you all the same stuff that original Medicare gives you. Okay. And may, maybe even more. All right. Medicare Part D is strictly prescription drug coverage. And this folks is the only thing that the government requires you get once you fire up both of these pieces and step off of other qualified coverage. The only people who can get away with not enrolling in Medicare Part D are veterans. If, if you're a vet, thank you for your service. If you get VA health coverage, your health coverage does not negate your your need to sign up for Part B, you still have to sign up for Part B and pay those premiums, but it does allow you to take the pass on D. So if you're getting all of your prescriptions through the VA and that works for you, wonderful. You don't have to get this and you're not gonna be penalized for not having it. If you wanna get it just because you want more flexibility on where to get your drugs, you can certainly get this and double up on your coverage, okay? But everybody else, even if you're not taking a single prescription, you gotta get this piece or you'll be penalized for it if you don't, all right? So those are our foundational pieces. This is the first page of your handout. I like to make a clear as mud topic sort of simple and I'm a very visual person. And so I think this chart is a good example of, of what I like to call the 10,000 foot view of Medicare. Why? Because the first thing you do when you fire up part A and B is you need to make some decisions about which path you're gonna travel, okay? Medicare is really good, but remember before I said it was incomplete and I'm gonna show you where your financial exposure is in a minute, right? But what it also doesn't have is prescription drug coverage. So we're definitely going to need to add that piece in. And you can get it standalone or you can get it as part of a Medicare Advantage plan. And then you might want to think about getting a supplement because one of the things about your Medicare benefits is there's no max out of pocket in Medicare. All right. Here's the good news, bad news. Medicare, unlimited benefit. You need a heart transplant, kidney dialysis, a new shoulder, a new knee, and all in your lifetime. They're going to pay for all of it. But every time they pay, you're going to have your portion to pay. And they will never cap you out either, which is very different from what we're used to if we've been on group insurance plans or even individual marketplace policies, right? We know that there's some worst case scenario number that if we have a bad year health wise and we hit that, we're done. That doesn't exist in Medicare. Okay. So you either want to move into a managed care plan that's got some max out of pocket or you want to back up your A and B with one of these things, okay? Part D, Medicare supplements, also called Medigap plans, okay? Two names for the same thing. And Medicare Advantage, known by Medicare as Part C. All of these pieces in Medicare are sold by private insurance companies. So this is the only piece that you can get through the Social Security office, okay? You got to go to Social Security to sign up for this stuff, but the Part D and the supplement and the, and the advantage plan, that's where we play. You know, that's what, that's what I do for a living. I help people navigate and choose those things. All right. So let's break down our foundational coverage, Medicare Part A. As I mentioned before, most Americans don't have a premium on this, okay, because they've paid for it in, in tax contribution. Medicare Part A covers you for hospitalization on an inpatient basis. It covers you for skilled nursing. So maybe you get discharged from the hospital, but you need to go on to a post-acute care facility or rehab facility to get your strength back before you can go home and do a flight of stairs, right? That's what that is. Home health services, maybe you don't need to go to the rehab facility. Maybe you can be discharged, go home and have someone like a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant come to your house to do PT or change wound dressings or administer medications, okay? All of that will be by a Medicare approved provider, It'll be short-term in duration and your doctor will generally write an order for it uh, post-discharge, okay? So that's covered also under Part A. And then hospice, whether it's end-of-life hospice or hospice that leads you back to palliative care, whether it's in your home or in a facility, there's a wonderful benefit under Medicare Part A. Now, Medicare Part A, we said has no premium, but it definitely has financial exposure and that's what this looks like, okay? The first night you are admitted to the hospital, we might go into the hospital through the ER, right? And then one of two things is gonna happen. They're either gonna keep us overnight, they don't wanna send us home, they'll keep us under observation until they figure out what's going on and then they might send us home or they might admit us. If it's apparent what's going on or if it's an elective thing that we've scheduled, we're gonna get admitted, right? 
So that admission is what triggers that number. And it's a big number, $1,556. And it triggers on night number one when you're admitted. Now, it's a big number, but it covers you upon discharge up and through day 60. So if you were particularly unlucky or unhealthy and you were in the hospital for something and then went home and a week and a half later, you had something else happen, complication or maybe something completely different happened and you had to go back into the hospital under admission, you're in that 60 day benefit window. So you're not gonna get dinged with that twice. But let's say it was, it was uh, two months and three days later, right? You've passed the 60 day mark. They're gonna ding you with that a second time if you have an admission beyond 60 days, okay? So just know that this is a benefit that you're or a, a financial piece that you're responsible for under that Medicare Part A hospital benefit. Skilled nursing, I gotta put a floating asterisk by skilled nursing because this benefit, the first 20 days that's picked up 100% by Medicare, it has a trigger. That trigger is three nights admission in the hospital, all right? I have found in my career of doing this that it's apparent when people are in the hospital for five, six days, right? Only to find out, and this has happened to clients of mine, that you know three of those nights were observation and then the last two were admission. Well, guess what? They need three under admission to get that skilled nursing bill picked up at 100% keep losing my. Um, so that first 20 days, you've got to have those three nights admission or that bill is going to be on you. Okay. So just be aware of that, of that nuance. If you're there past 20 days, then Medicare says, okay, we're still going to support you, but we're going to charge you 194.50 per day. Okay. That's your copay. So like a night in a hotel, right? but not so much fun. Um, so the next 80 days you're covered at that copay per day. Now, once you get to day 101, that's when Medicare says, okay, time out. We're glad we were able to support you and be here for you, but we are not long-term care insurance. So now they view you as being in some sort of long-term situation. And you either, if you're going to stay there, you can invoke a long-term care insurance policy. Um, you can pay out of assets, but your Medicare benefits are going to stop. Okay. Medigap plans, supplements, Medicare Advantage plans. They do not extend that benefit for you. The cost structure might be different, but they don't extend that for you. It's 100 days flat. Now, this isn't in your lifetime. It's per event, okay? So, but just know that you need that three nights admission to get the first 20 picked up. Sure. Yeah. So good question. So um, the question was, what is a skilled nursing facility? So um, a symphony home, a Marion Joy, if you're going on to a rehab facility or any kind of post-acute care after hospitalization, because you can't do all of your activities of daily living and you need some assistance until you can get your strength back or your, your recovery from your operation is such that you can be sent home to re finish recovery, that's what that is, okay? Okay, home health services we talked about, that's covered at 100%. Nobody's coming to your house to clean or do the you know, grocery shopping. It's medically necessary things from a medical professional. And then hospice, to be fair, I put 5% copay because sometimes we fill prescriptions to keep us comfortable at end of life, but generally hospice is also a covered benefit at 100%. Question. So $1,556 is the hospital deductible that you pay the first night you're admitted. However, let's say you go in for an appendectomy and you're in and out of there in three, four days, okay? You've paid that charge or maybe you have a supplement that paid it for you, okay? Um, and now you're home and it's three weeks later and you have a heart attack and you go back into the hospital you're still within your 60 day window upon discharge. So they're not gonna ask you for that number a second time. But let's say now it's six months later and you're out shoveling the snow in the driveway and you fall and break your leg. Well, that's, you know, on day 61, this resets. So 
that's how. Now, we certainly have a broader benefit beyond 60 days in hospital admission, okay? The next 30 days, between days 61 and 90, you're covered at a copay of 300 and some dollars a day, all right? That's your financial responsibility. Then we all have 60 more lifetime reserve days. So this is contiguous admission in the hospital, right? So days 91 through 150 is going to bill at 700 and some dollars a day. All right. Again, you can have a Medigap plan that potentially wipes that out for you and pays it for you. All right. Um, if you're on Medicare Advantage, this structure of billing goes out the window because Medicare is not getting your bills. A private insurance company is getting your bills. So what happens in that model is the insurance company is deciding, okay, if you're admitted to the hospital, the first five, six, or seven days you're there, you're going to pay us $250 per day, and then you're done. Or you'll pay us $300 per day, and then you're done. You know, So they decide what these amounts look like. All right. Um, Medicare Part B. Base premium for all Americans this year, $170.10 per person per month. Who saw the uh, Joe Namath advertising on TV that said, you could get your Medicare Part B paid for? And, uh, they're talking about people who qualify for state Medicaid benefits, okay? So don't be swayed that, you know, you could be getting something back on your Part B. Maybe if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan that had a benefit like a $30 Part B give back or something, you know, maybe you might get some of your Part B paid for in that model of insurance. But quite honestly, um, it, you know, there are very few plans that have that, that benefit structure. So what they're really shouting at to people are those that qualify for both state and federal benefits. Okay. So you got to be below the 140%, I think below the poverty level for, for state benefits. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So is there a like in other words, do they cover that? I'm on part A and part B. Yeah. Do they cover that? I mean, I so here's the thing. Um the question was about orthotics as covered under durable medical equipment. The durable medical equipment is everything from a walker and a wheelchair to a pacemaker, a COPD machine, an insulin pump. Orthotics generally I have not seen be covered. Um, you, you do have to check because sometimes it, it depends on medical necessity, but the durable medical equipment bucket is kind of a sticky wicket. And so my advice would be to call 1-800-MEDICARE because your particular situation might necessitate them to be covered. And for other people, maybe not. Yeah, I, I can't answer that question. Again, I would say 1-800-MEDICARE because it's a very nuanced thing, particularly with DME. All right. But just know that it is a broad range of things. I generally, in my experience, haven't seen much in the orthotics category covered. Um, this is where the lion's share of your bills are going to go when you get to Medicare, which is why this is the piece that you must turn on when you step off of other qualified coverage. OK, all of your doctors are going to bill to be the surgeons, those that you see in the office, the anesthesiologist that knocks you out so the surgeon can operate on you. They're all going to bill to be. Any kind of lab services you might have, blood work, biopsies, all of your expensive diagnostic tests, what I like to call the alphabet soup, the EKGs, EEGs, MRIs, PET scans, CAT scans. Um, we talked about DME. All of your therapies, physical therapy, mental health therapy, occupational therapy, your ambulance ride, okay, that expensive transport to and from the hospital, that's covered under me. Anything that happens to you in the ER, all of your ER services, Anything outpatient, this is a big bucket, folks. There are medical miracles happening every day, and it is not uncommon. I think once a month, I'll, I'll have a client that'll get a full hip replacement done on an outpatient basis. It's crazy. So not only would this be an outpatient procedure in a hospital, it could also be in a freestanding surgical center. It could also be um, an overnight in the hospital where they don't admit you, right? You go in for, to the ER for something, you're not feeling so right, they don't want to send you home, so they keep you there, but they don't admit you, they keep you under observation. The entirety of that stay is going to build to Part B, all right? And then clinical Rx, this is the rough stuff, hopefully you don't incur it in your lifetime, but it's 
chemotherapy, kidney dialysis, radiation therapy. It could be injections for rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, you know, progesterone or testosterone injections, anything that's infused, radiated, or injected in a doctor's office, in a clinical setting, in a lab, in an infusion center, it builds to your medical plan, not your Part D drug coverage. Now, from time to time, we will rarely see a specialty medication, a tier five medication that is categorically, um, you, you have an option of taking it in the privacy of your own home, maybe in a pill form, okay? And that's wonderful and super convenient. But what it could impact is, is how much you pay. Because if you decide to dispense that at Walgreens and take it home, guess what? Now it's going to run up under your Part D as in drug coverage. It's going to have a high retail value, which is going to rush you to the coverage gap, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. But it, it will cost you a small fortune. Okay, So you have some decisions to make if you ever run into a clinical Rx med in your lifetime, hopefully not. But if you have an option for how you can get it, um, you, know, you might want to think a little bit about which way it could bill. Okay. So Medicare Part B, I said, has no pre has that premium, the base premium of 170. It also has an annual deductible of 233. Let me repeat that. An annual deductible of $233. Okay. This is crazy good. For people who are on the Affordable Care Act, you know that unless you're getting a significant premium subsidy, you're not paying a 233 deductible. It costs you a thousand dollars just to walk into the ER. Okay, so this deductible is phenomenal. And it, we see the price rise a little bit every year. It goes up a couple bucks, okay? But generally, um, it, even compared to some outstanding employer plans I've seen for an individual, that's a, that's a very low deductible. Then Medicare takes, it, takes their negotiated discount, right? There's millions of Americans on Medicare and they negotiate pricing down, 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 down. You're gonna love that when you're in Medicare, all right? So after they take their negotiated discount, then they're gonna split bills with you 80-20. They're gonna pay 80 cents on the dollar. You're responsible for 20 cents on the dollar. Now, the 20 cents on the dollar that you're responsible for includes all of these things. And remember, no max out of pocket concept. So that scares people, right? Because 20% of a blood panel, not so bad of an office visit, not too bad, but you start to add in some outpatient surgeries, maybe some infusions or injections, that stuff can go off the rails pretty quick, okay? So you definitely wanna add at a minimum some sort of firewall behind your Medicare benefits or at least something to minimize that financial out of pocket for you, okay? So that's when we go back to our chart and we decide which path are we gonna travel. Most people will travel the path of original Medicare initially and they will choose among one of these 10 Medigap plans. Now. This landscape is defined by Medicare. These, what these policies cover are defined by Medicare. They simply let private insurance companies sell them to the public, okay? So when people say to me, Robin, are you telling me that my D plan with Blue Cross Blue Shields is the same as my D plan from Aetna or from United Healthcare? No, they're identical, okay? There's no difference because the government decides what D covers. Now, I will tell you in the years of doing this, there have been three policies that have really driven the market. 90 plus percent, I would say, of all the Medicare supplements sold by insurance companies in any state usually fall in these three buckets, all right? And that's because they're easy to understand, all right? If this is all of that financial exposure I just went on, went on about uh, under Part A and B, and you go across the chart, well, look, the F plan, it wipes it all away. Heck, it even pays that measly 233 deductible. One of the only plans it did. Now, here's a thing, though. If you're not in Medicare already, in January of 2020, new legislation was passed that said, if you reached Medicare age after that date, you cannot buy three plans on this chart. You can't buy C, the letter C as in cat. You can't buy F as in Frank and you can't buy the high deductible version of F, right? Now, if you're in Medicare and you have those plans, you can keep them. If you aged in before January 1st of 2020, you can also move into them if you choose, all right? It's just anybody who turned 65 or reached their eligibility for Medicare after that date 
can't choose those three plans. Now, if you have one of those plans, I'm gonna get up on my soapbox and give you a two minute speech as to why you may wanna consider moving out of them. The way these plans work is that when you buy a letter plan from an insurance company in Illinois, you're joining a risk pool of people, okay, that are all sharing claims as they age. So you know the, the old adage, there's safety in numbers? Well, if you're in one of the plans that Medicare turned off to new enrollment, guess what? There aren't any new healthy 65-year-olds jumping into your plan. So your plan looks like this today. And in a few years, it's going to look like this. In a few years, it's going to look like this. And folks, the law of nature is we're going to file more claims as we age, right? So the claims are going to go up. They're going to be fewer people to spread. What's going to happen to your rates on those plans? They're going to go up. Now, having been in this business a while, I know that the last time Medicare did anything with this chart was 2010. And in 2010, there used to be 14 of these plans. So they crunched them down to the 10 you see. And then just recently in 2020, they crunched them down to eight, right? The 14 plans, there were a couple that looked just like F. One of them had dental. It was letter J. And people who hung on to J, two, three, more years past the, the turnoff period, saw their rates rise by double digits. On this landscape, you need to budget for your premiums to increase on average 5 to 8% a year. Okay. Why? Because the insurance companies that play in this field, they have to play by Medicare rules. And rule number one is they have to take you when you first come. What does when you first come mean? Well, it can be at age 65 or it can be at age 68 or it can be at age 72. Whenever you turn on part B and step off of other qualified coverage, that's the, that's the time clock start. And then you have six months from that period where you can choose any of these policies from any insurance company in the state of Illinois, and nobody can ask you anything about your health. You cannot be denied. You cannot be rated up for health conditions. You have free reign of what you want to choose. So it's the best time to shop around for the most coverage from a reputable company at a good price. Okay. When that six month window is over and everybody gets it just once. All right. When that six month window is over, you can still change these policies any month out of the year because these are month to month policies. Sometimes people think, oh, I can only change my supplement during the annual enrollment. Not true. You can change them any month out of the year. However, now that your six month open enrollment window is gone, now you're going to have to fill out questions about your health on the application. They're going to pull your medical records. They're going to pull your prescription drug list for so many years back. And they're going to put you through what's called underwriting, which is basically just looking at your health history and deciding, thanks, but no thanks. You either get the coverage or you don't get the coverage. All right. Now, in some cases, you might not have serious things going on, but you might have a, co a co combination of conditions with a certain list of medications where they say mm, higher risk and they may rate you up to a higher price. OK, but generally it's usually a yes or no. All right. So that's why you'll hear people say, um, you know, pick right the first time because you can never get something in the future. It's not true. You, 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 I have seen many, many, many people who have had, you know, heart transplants 10 years ago that are perfectly fine, that are on basic maintenance medications, and they're able to get through underwriting. But then I've also seen, you know, super healthy people that simply had a joint replacement a year and a half ago. And because that surgery wasn't two years post-op, they got denied right? So sometimes it's timing and sometimes it's related to, you know, you just, you're dealing with some stuff, right? And that stuff is precluding you from getting a policy. But that's how this works. So you cannot be denied when you first come. Um, they can never drop you. They have to pay if Medicare pays, which is why later, if you ever want to change, they're going to put you through the ringer and, ask, you know, look at your health history because they, you know, they can't bump you know, bump a bill, right? Medicare pays, they got to pay. Um, the only time you can be dropped is if you fail to pay your premium. So you got to stay on top of that. Um, but you're theirs and they're yours until you decide to move from them. You definitely want to stay with big companies, good track record in the business, A-rated financially, and have that modest track record of rate increases. Okay. Yes. Um, so if you're on Medicare, 
<clears throat> Correct. It's an either or choice. Okay. If we, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here's the thing. Medicare is the U.S. health insurance for seniors. It's not recognized in London or Ireland or anywhere else in the world. So if you have a medical event and you're in Italy, you pay out of pocket for that medical event. You bring those bills back. You submit them to Medicare. OK, and if you have one of these policies that have this foreign travel emergency right here, they've got that coverage right there. What they're going to do, Medicare is going to do, is they're going to take the entirety of that bill from, from your Italy event, and they're going to send it to your supplement company. And your supplement company is going to charge you an additional $250 deductible on that medical event. And then they're going to pick up 80% of the bill, and you're going to be responsible for 20%. Okay? Now, caveat, floating asterisk. The 80% that they pay on that event and any event in the future in your lifetime is it caps out at 50,000. So it's very limited. So I it's something though, right? So my advice is if you're going on the trip of a lifetime, you know, you're going to you're going on a month long tour of Europe and you're going to be in a couple of different countries, do yourself a favor and get major medical travel insurance. Um, that's something I help a lot of my clients with. The minute COVID restrictions were lifted and people were on flights, I was getting a ton of calls. We're going here, we're going there, we're going there. And, it, and it's very, very cheap to buy for the duration of your trip major medical coverage that you can actually use if you're hospitalized, if you need pharmaceuticals, if you know, and you can invoke that insurance. And it's, it, it can be turned on immediately. So you turn it on the day you leave, you turn it off the day you come back. Okay. So I'm going to get to that in a second. <laughs> so Medicare Advantage, we're going to cover in a bit. But yes, it's an either or choice. So this is just back up to the federal government insurance. And that insurance is your primary. These guys, just secondary bill payers. OK, but they effectively can wipe out a, all of or a lot of your out-of-pocket expenses. They do have a monthly cost. So average female turning 65. If an F plan runs you about $165 a month, a G might be $110 a month, an N might be under $100 a month, okay? And the reason is, is every time you're willing to take on a little bit more risk, right? F paid for everything, but G, if you're willing to pay that first $233, you can save seven, dollars $800 a year in premiums. Now, I'm not an actuary, but that seems like a no-brainer to me. I don't know why people who are in F and paying a lot for F wouldn't just shift to G if they could right now. It'd save them a ton of money. If you're the kind of person that says, Robin, I don't need that kind of coverage. I go to the doctor once or twice a year. I'm generally healthy. I see my primary. I see my cardiologist twice a year. But other than that, knock on wood, you know, things are good. Well, then I might say to you, you know, go for a plan N. What does a plan N say? Plan N says pay that same 233 deductible. Okay, right here. Empty box, empty box. But you also might have to pay down here, co-pays up to $20 for office visits, right? $50 if you go to the ER and you're not admitted. So now if G is deductible, N is deductible plus the occasional copay for office visit or ER visit, all right? There's one other thing N makes you financially responsible for. And if you notice on this chart, second row from the bottom, no other supplement covers it anymore except for G. Part B excess charges, right? Has anybody ever run into a Part B excess charge? Anybody in Medicare in here? What a Part B excess charge is, is there's, there's two types of doctors that participate in the Medicare system, those that accept assignment and those that may not accept assignment, which means they might balance bill, okay? What's the difference? About 5%, okay? 95% of all doctors that accept Medicare accept assignment. They're taking Medicare's discounted rate as payment in full. Those that you know are highly specialized surgeons or in a skilled facility like Johns Hopkins or Mayo Clinic, they might pass along an excess charge and Medicare will allow it, but they cap it out at no more than 15% of the Medicare negotiated reimbursement rate. So let me give you an example. You see a doctor, they bill 500 for an office visit. Medicare says you're adorable and talented, but we're gonna reimburse at 300 for that office visit. The most that doctor could pass through in an excess charge if they didn't accept assignment, would be $45, 15% of the 300, okay? Not the five, not the difference. So if you were on an N plan, that charge you would be responsible for. If you were on a G plan, it would get paid for, okay? 
So that's, you know, most lavish coverage, middle of the road coverage. What's the cheapest option on here? Let's say you don't want to go to Medicare Advantage. You don't want to be restricted because on this chart, you can see any doctor anywhere in the U.S. that accepts Medicare. You're in. Okay, the question is, does my doctor take, you know, this carrier versus that carrier in a supplement? No, no, no. You're asking the wrong question. Does my doctor take Medicare? If your doctor takes Medicare, your supplement's going to work no matter where you are in the United States of America. Medicare Advantage is different. Remember, managed care means PPO, HMO, right? So if you don't want to go that route, but you want the lowest possible cost for one of these plans, you could get a high deductible version of a G or an F if you qualify. The G plan works as, you know, you pay the 233, and then on anything under Part B after that deductible, Medicare splits bills with you 80-20, so you'd have to pay your 20% coinsurance on office visits and lab tests and ER visits. All those amounts that you're paying, though, would count toward a maximum this year of $2,490. There isn't a Medicare Advantage HMO plan in the state right now that has, a low, has that low of an in-network max out-of-pocket. Okay, so it's an interesting idea, but you'd be responsible for those charges under A and B up until you reach that amount. You may never reach that amount, but if you do, then the plan would kick in and act like a standard G. What if you're hospitalized? You got to pay that $1,558, okay? But again, that's going to count toward the $2,490. So you're almost halfway there. You know what I mean? So if, even for a big hospital event that you weren't anticipating, you're still going to get capped out. So whenever I see people walking around with just a Medicare card and a drug plan in their pocket, it makes me really nervous because what they don't realize is that at a minimum, you know, if you're 65 years old, you can get a high deductible plan for $45, $50 a month. Okay. And at least put a barrier behind your financial exposure. Okay. So that's Medigap plans, but now you still need drug coverage. I think I lost my, yes. You cannot. If, if, if you became Medicare eligible after January 1st of 2020, the people who became Medicare eligible prior to that date can still buy it. Well, if you notice, the C plan and the F plan were the only two remaining plans that paid that Part B deductible. So Medicare likes people to have skin in the game. They want you to have a first dollar in experience, okay? Because you might think twice then and you won't sneeze hard and go get an MRI, right? So if you have a first dollar in experience, that sometimes mitigates people's overuse of the system. So, but they, they all, you know, that's one reason. Another reason is you've got many plans, you've got other plans on here that very closely mirror that. So, okay. So now you've got your SUP, but you do need drug coverage. And Jez has a question from the virtual world. Can I answer? Oh, someone, th the question that was just asked was about plan F because I was referencing the difference in costs between F and G and high deductible F and G and how they worked. Um, people who are 60, who turned 65 or reached their Medicare eligibility prior to January 1st of 2020, if they have those plans, they can keep them and they can also still buy them. Just folks who didn't reach that age after January 1st of 2020. You do need drug coverage though on this side of the equation so that we're gonna have to pick up separately. Now, what we do with Medicare Part D is we design this, the best of the best with the best of the best and we piece it together for you, okay? So Part D plans are not all the same. It is not a one size fits all here. We look at your specific list of medications and where you like to fill them. And then we go for a top rated plan that it's gonna give you the lowest combined cost for the calendar year. That's how you need to pick part D. And this is not always the most straightforward thing to do, but we have a great resource and tool, which is medicare.gov, oops, sorry. But before I talk about that, let's just talk about the rules of the road for D. You got to get it. Remember when you first come, otherwise you're going to be charged a late enrollment penalty. And this folks is not a one-time hit, right? It accrues in the background until you finally decide to pick up a drug plan. And then once you do, 
they tack on that accumulated penalty onto your premium every month in perpetuity for the rest of your life. So the only way you can ever get relieved of it is if you qualify for Medicaid or extra help from the federal government. So please don't kick the can down on the road on Medicare Part D. Even if you're taking absolutely nothing, insurance companies have made it super cheap to just get your foot in the door. This year, we had a plan that was under $7 a month, okay? Years ago, the entry point used to be $30, $40 a month. And I can get people getting a little grumpy about not having to take any drugs and having to pay $40 a month for a drug plan. But now is not the case anymore, okay? So you definitely don't want to pass. You can do your drug plans over. Every year between that annual election period of October 15 to December 7th for the next calendar year. Why might you want to revisit your drug plan three, four, five years down the road? Well, a couple of things can happen. You might get new drugs. You might get pulled off other drugs, right? You might have brand name drugs that now have a generic equivalent. Yay, it'll cost less, right? You might not need that expensive drug plan you chose for that brand name drug. And the insurance companies will always keep you on your toes by changing things as well. And the Medicare formulary, the master formulary that Medicare sets of all common prescription drugs people take, that adjusts annually too, all right? So you might wanna look at this if you haven't in a number of years. Different formularies, right? Medicare sets that master formulary, but then every drug plan decides how they wanna cover a certain set of drugs. Um, one insurance company might have four different drug plans. And they might design the formulary of covered drugs around really expensive drugs. In another plan, they might super serve generic drugs at no copay or a dollar or two dollars, right? So you want to look for what's best for you and your particular list. Now, there are three stages of coverage in drug plans. I would say most plans have four stages of coverage because a lot of them have deductibles, okay? So that looks like this. So first page of your handout was the two paths you can travel. Second page of your handout was the Medigap chart. Third page of your handout is part these stages of coverage. This is important to understand, especially if anyone in this room is taking a brand name drug because brand name drugs inherently have a higher retail price point. And even if you have a great Part D plan that's allowing you to get that expensive drug for a $30, $40 copay, Medicare does not track what you pay at the pharmacy. They track the value that that drug is worth. And every time you fill that drug, they add up that retail value until you hit that first threshold of $4,430. When you get there in acquired value of drugs, then they throw you into something called the coverage gap or donut hole. Who's heard about this from friends? Stay out of the donut hole. It's not a sweet place to be, okay? The donut hole requires you to pay 25% of the retail value of all your drugs when you fall there. So now your $500 Zarelto that is costing you $40 in the initial stage of coverage after you've paid off your deductible now jumps to 125 because it's 25% of the retail value. And you're stuck paying that percentage on everything you're filling until you reach the next threshold, which is 7,050. And then you get rate relief. Here's the carrot and the stick. This was designed by the government to drive people to take more generic drugs. The problem is, is the pharmaceutical industry barricades their patents around brand name drugs. And so there aren't generic equivalents for many common things that people are prescribed. And so they get stuck playing this game, trying to optimize their prescription drug expense in stages one and two, deductible stage and initial stage, because when they get here, it doesn't matter what part D plan you're on, you're gonna be paying 25% of retail. Now, there are strategies we teach our clients to use. Who uses GoodRx in this room? Canadian Drugs Online. These are wholesale discount coupons that you can use to maybe get your drugs either for a cheaper cost to fill, or it may be no difference out of your pocket whether you fill your drugs under the plan or whether you use a GoodRx coupon. But if you use a GoodRx coupon and it's $20 either way for you, the retail value of that drug though, if it's three, $400, could keep you from entering this stage of coverage. Like if you can push that out to September, October, November versus jumping in in June or July, you're gonna save yourself a bunch of money. 
So all of these strategies are the kinds of things that we, we encourage people to do to minimize their prescription drug expense, okay? This is still a pretty broken part of Medicare, my personal opinion. And so we have to, we have to follow the rules, but we also have to really keep our eyes on this um, and, and make sure that we're you know, looking at it. Now, do you have to look at this every year? No, um, especially if you have a relatively benign drug list. Okay, but if you're taking any brand name drugs or if your medications have been a little volatile, you know, your doctor is trying some things with you, right? They're taking on and off stuff and you just want to make sure that you're you're factoring that in when you're looking at this. And, and it could be something that you end up reviewing more often than, than quite on, honestly, you really want to. But that's why we're here. Okay, we do this with our clients um, annually as, as they need it. Okay. Okay, so. In Medicare, there's a five-tier system. A lot of us are used to three tiers on group plans. You know, you have your generics, your brands, and your specialty. Five tiers facilitate more competition in the industry, and it also gives people some leeway. Um, your tier ones and twos are going to be your lowest cost drugs, lower retail value, lower cost to you when you fill it. Tier threes and fours are going to be the ones advertised on TV. Maybe the fours are got a famous spokesperson, but they're going to cost a little more. And they're certainly going to cost you more at the pharmacy when you go to fill them. And then tier five, this is where you might have one of those clinical RX drugs that instead of getting it infused or injected at the doctor's office, you can get it dispensed at the pharmacy. All right. Think about that and how you want to get that drug. All right. How do we figure this out? All right. Well, there's a person you can call <laughs> or you can go to medicare.gov. And if you're in Medicare already, set your, and you have a fairly robust drug list, set yourself up an account on medicare.gov, type in your medications and save it. So every year you don't have to go back and redo it, right? And if you go on and off drugs, you can just plug in your new ones and see how, it's, how, how you're impacted on your current plan. But we use this tool. We go to the find, help, find plans tab at the bottom, and then we'll go through that process. We'll put in all of your medications, the, the name, the dose, how often you take it. We'll choose the pharmacies you like to fill at. And then we'll get a laundry list of all the drug plans that cover your specific list of medications in your zip code, right? And we're going to sort them from least expensive to most expensive, but we're going to look at the star ratings. <laughs> Medicare star rates these plans. Supplements, you can only look at the financial rating of the parent company, but, but Medicare Part D and C plans, they get star ratings by Medicare. So general rule of thumb is you want to stay three stars and above. Okay, don't mess around with anything under three stars. All right, you will log into a plan, you'll get all these choices and you'll pick one. And when you go into the plan detail, you'll see something like this, okay? So this person happens to fill these five drugs. Immediately, my eyes are gonna look at this number because this is the retail value number that is gonna calculate them, that's gonna, that's gonna be calculated to move them through the stages of coverage, right? This is a great plan though, because for $25 a month, this person, after they pay off their deductible of 480, which they're going to pay the first time they fill Eloquist, right? Eloquist is going to cost them the full amount the first time they fill it, but then they're going to get Eloquist for 30 bucks, right? So that's, that's pretty great. And they'll be in that initial stage of coverage paying $60 for all their meds, but every time they pay 60, Medicare's adding up 572. So 572 plus 572 plus 572, okay? I stink at math in my head, but about August or September, they're gonna hit the coverage gap. And then they're gonna pay for that same list, 143. So what can they do? Well, there's no current generic for Eliquis, but there is for Ventolin, Buterol inhaler, right? They might be able to good RX and stuff. So that, that's how we are gonna kind of revisit this and, and look at maybe potentially pushing out, you know, their coverage gap entrance you know, from August, maybe to later in the year, if that's possible, by switching them to some generic equivalents or other therapeutic categories. Best thing to do is have a clubhouse meeting with your doctor. If you're taking some expensive medications right now that you're using manufacturer discount coupons for, you're not going to be able to use them anymore when you come to Medicare Part D, all right? If your group insurance plan is covering very expensive medications at a low copay, you're going to want to have a conversation with your doctor about any alternatives because chances are those are going to start to cost you a lot more when you get to Medicare Part D. All right. Don't be mad at the messenger. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to prepare you for the runway. We want to see this coming eight lanes wide is basically the message. All right. So 
Original Medicare, any doctor in the U.S. that accepts Medicare, you've got your backup coverage. You've decided what the level of that should be. And we've optimized, based on your current prescriptions, a cost-effective Medicare Part D plan. And the years go by. And maybe you alone or you and your spouse, you start to see the premiums rise on your Medigap plans and your drug coverage. You haven't looked at that. Maybe we can optimize that. We can move you to another company for a lower price. We can tweak your drug coverage and bring your premiums and your costs down, okay? Or you might decide, you know what? I don't need access to any, every doctor in the U.S. that accepts Medicare anymore. I'm, I'm no longer a snowbird. I'm no longer moving around as much. I'm pretty much doing everything at Advocate, and I'm stay, spending a lot of time in Illinois, right? Then this, Medicare Advantage, might be a great way for you to start. Or alternatively, you might say to yourself, I'm a relatively healthy gal, right? I'm not doing a lot in the healthcare system. I want to start my Medicare journey in a pay-as-you-go model, okay? There are a lot of wonderful PPO plans that you can still stay in network, use the national doctor network. Um, if you're doing everything in one medical group, an HMO might be an awesomely cost-effective way for you to go about paying for your health care. But these plans work a little different, and so I want you to understand the alternative that you have. The first thing you need to know is, you know, more restrictive access. Okay, like I said, the PPO plans are very flexible. Years ago, they used to not be, but they are. HMO is not a dirty word. HMO is, could be a great value plan for most people, but it generally means that you have to be doing everything within one medical group. So you're getting all of your care at Northwestern or all of your care at Rush, okay? And that's because you're gonna need referrals from your primary care doctor. And we have big medical groups in the state that have spent a lot of money to bring every specialty known to man into their medical group. So they're going to give you a referral in their medical group. You're not going to get the referral out. So that's why HMOs, you kind of have to be operating in one place. You're going to have co-pays for services. All right. Despite what Joe Namath says, free, 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 and free applies to your primary care office visits and all your preventative care. And maybe some ancillary benefits that the insurance company has just decided to stuff in to attract you to the plan like the gym club membership and the over-the-counter benefit and the dental and the vision and the hearing aid benefit, okay? Those aren't core to Medicare, folks. Those are extra bells and whistles that the insurance company has put in there to help keep you well and entice you to join the plan, all right? It's wonderful that they're there. Um, they can afford to add those things. Medicare can't, all right? But everything you do beyond that will have a copay. So now you go to a specialist visit, you go to see your, car, your, your cardiologist, your cardiologist isn't going to bill Medicare Part B. They're going to bill your private insurance, HMO or PPO, and that office visit is going to have a flat copay, $35, $45, $50, depends on the plan, okay? And that amount you pay will count toward the max out of pocket. Um, there is capped exposure. That's what the max out of pocket is there for, okay? Worst case scenario. When we look at these plans, I personally, I like the low, no premium plans. Why? Because if you're going to restrict your physician access and you're going to pay as you go, you should get something in return. So I want you to get low fixed costs for the insurance per month and some extra bells and whistles, right? So that's what I generally try to look for and low, low max out of pocket amounts, as low as we can get. Um, Part D is generally included, not in all plans, but in most plans. And if you don't have another source for creditable Part D drug coverage, you have to get, I would encourage you to get a plan with Part D. It works the same, same stages of coverage, same tiering system, okay? So, you know, generally you'll find comparable formularies. But you can only move in and out of these plans on a calendar year. So the annual election period. Yes. Yes. So the question was, is a co-payment for services different than a deductible? Yes, a deductible is what you have to pay first before the insurance starts to kick in and split bills with you. In Medicare Advantage in the state of Illinois, I don't think there are any plans, maybe one, I don't, that have a medical deductible. So day one, dime one, you're contributing to the cost of your care um, on a Medicare Advantage plan. You don't have that 233 deductible under Part B because the, the, the cost structure of the, of the plan is, you know, it, well, the, right. Yeah, because your bills aren't going to Medicare. So 
If the plan has a deductible, which I don't think there's a Medicare Advantage plan in the state of Illinois that's sold that does have a medical deductible. There might be a Part D drug deductible, but on most of the plans, I think all of them don't have a medical deductible. So you start paying the copay right away. So yeah, that's a nice thing about Advantage. Now, one thing to point out is the first time you try Medicare Advantage, you have a one-year trial right where you can get out at any time, okay? So you can always go back to original Medicare, pick up a drug plan off cycle, and you can apply for a supplement, being the optimal word, if you're out of your annual enrollment for the supplements, okay? Um, otherwise, once you're in this model of insurance, Part C, for more than a year, then you're locked into that calendar year cycle, okay? And these do have great benefits related to some preventative care that Medicare leaves you open to self-insure for. Here's the good news. We're in a very highly competitive insurance market. So when one big carrier adds, adds a dental benefit, so do all the rest, okay? When another adds a gym club membership, so do all the rest. When another one adds a hearing aid benefit, so do all the rest. But you have to be mindful of the fact that those benefits are also tied to a network, okay? Now on PPOs, you can sometimes go out of network and see who you wanna see. As long as they haven't opted out of Medicare, your benefit will work, the dollars just won't go as far, okay? But the devil's in the detail on those plans. So, you know, really do work with someone to look up your doctors, make sure they're all in network, look up your drugs, make sure, you know, make sure that the cost structure for the things you're currently doing is reasonable to you. And if it is, these can work beautifully for a lot of people, okay? It's not everybody's cup of tea. You know, some people like that side, but this can be a wonderful option. And they have become much more flexible. On an HMO, again, you're going to have only in-network benefits, one max out-of-pocket number. On a PPO, you're going to have two. You know, the cost structure if you go in and out of network, and then the cost structure if you do everything in-network. And your max out-of-pocket numbers will be, will be different. Um, and many carriers also now have these national doctor networks that you can avail when you're away from Illinois. So you can still stay in network even when you're away. On any plan, HMO or PPO, if you have a medical emergency and you're out of Illinois, it's considered an in-network event, okay? So any emergency situation is covered in network. And then some of the plans also have worldwide ER coverage. So the question before about what if I'm in another country, you can pop into an ER in another country and, uh, and be on advantage and have a, like a $90, $120 copay. Okay, yes. It's okay. Yeah. Medicare does not cover that. Does the supplement not cover as well? And what about Part C? So, Medicare does cover chiropractic. I believe it's up to 20 visits and it's for basic manual manipulation of the spine. So if you are doing anything fancier, it might not get covered. On Medicare Advantage, same, same type of thing, usually about 20 visits, manual manipulation of the spine only. So the, the benefits um, for that particular service run pretty parallel, whether you're in original Medicare or Medicare Advantage. Mm -hmm. Um, you, what do you mean evaluation? Oh, how, on Medicare? Yes. Great question. So the question was, are advantage plans measured and evaluated by Medicare like drug plans are? Yes, they are. Same five-star system. Okay. They're, they're making sure that they're operating right. Customer service, medical records, like have all the right things in place. Um, and again, stay with three-star plans and above. Don't mess with anything under three stars. And we have in the state of Illinois, it's such a competitive insurance market here. We've got four, four and a half. We got a lot of four, four and a half star plans this year. If you have a five-star plan in, your, in, in whatever state you live in, um, those, those plans can market year round. Otherwise, legally, insurance companies can only market to you during the annual enrollment, which is why the advertising ramps up so much, okay? So here we've got Medicare A and B. We've either chosen a supplement and a, and a drug plan, okay? Or we've chosen Medicare Advantage. You can bounce back and forth in your lifetime throughout the aging process. You can make changes. Just know that timing has bearing, your health has bearing, 
at least for supplements. There's never any medical underwriting for Medicare Advantage. There's never any medical consideration to change your drug coverage, but you can only do it between October 15th and December 7th, okay? Um, great options, a lot of information. I applaud all of you for coming and staying. I went over the hour, but thank you for sticking with me. Jez, do we have any questions from the virtual audience that I can address in, in person? Uh, yes, so we have a couple questions. Uh, Medicare will not send you the booklet until you're actually enrolled. Is that correct? That's correct, but you can download it on medicare.gov. Okay. Uh, so Bobby asks, are these plans only for the state of Illinois? What happens if they move out of state? If you move out of state, just like Medicare goes with you, your supplement will travel with you, okay? So your Illinois policy will work wherever you go. You don't need to change it. Your drug coverage, your standalone Part D plan, that, those are sold by state. So once you relocate, you'll have a special enrollment window to change your drug coverage once you notify the plan of your new address, okay? Um, with Advantage plans, those are actually sold by county. So if you move counties and your Advantage plan that was in Cook County is not available now in Kendall County, you will get a special enrollment to change. Similarly, if you're moving from Illinois to North Carolina, you'll get an opportunity to change. And that change is up to you. It can be Medicare Advantage to Medicare Advantage, or you can use that special enrollment to go back to original Medicare and get a supplement and a drug plan. It's entirely up to you, but you do have, Medicare understands that this population of insured they're mobile, you know, they move around, they cha think life changes as we age. And so um, they don't want to hand tie you. They want to give you the flexibility to make those adjustments. Great question. Yes. Um, generally, they want you to get into a new plan within, you know, 60 to 90 days. I mean, you're not going to want to be without drug coverage. Um, but most of the drug plans in particular, I mean, they're designed where you can use them anywhere. I mean, you can, you can go to a pharmacy in Florida when you're on vacation and fill your meds if you need to. But once you've relocated and notified the plan, this is my new physical address, and you're not in the state of Illinois then, 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 then they're going to say to you at that point, you, you know, you've got 60 days, you got to change your plan. And, and they'll generally, if you notify them in a calendar month, they're going to cut you off at the end of that month. So what I usually tell people is if you're moving, you've got a lot of other stuff going on, right? You're changing houses, you're packing and unpacking and give yourself some breathing room to, to get settled and then call your insurance company and say, hey, this is my new address because otherwise they're gonna cut you off and then you're gonna have to scramble to make changes on things, okay? The other thing I will tell people is a lot of times if you have an Advantage plan here in Illinois, Sometimes you might want to pivot to original Medicare with a supplement and a drug plan until you establish your new medical family in your new location. Unless you're moving to a place where you already know who your primary is going to be, what medical group you're going to use, because the best way to pick a Medicare Advantage plan is really designed around the doctors that are important to your care. Um, and you, you won't know that in your new location unless you've been going there for years and finally are now making a move, you know? So I, I try to always de-stress the situation for people. Well, if you're relocating out of the area where that plan is available, you trigger a special enrollment. So that can be at any time. Otherwise, if, if let's say you're just moving somewhere within Cook County, um, you, that doesn't give you a special enrollment to change because the plan's still available where you are, your new location. Yeah, so, so she's, oh, wait a minute. So you go to a physician. She only takes Medicare Advantage. So um, there is one medical group in the state who has, uh, it's Dooley, um, who has taken a subset of their primary care practice and they only take Medicare Advantage you've got one of those doctors. So you have a choice. 
you can either change your doctor or you can change your insurance. But, um, well, you're not there yet, but that, you know, that's kind of the pivot point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, and I work with all the practices in, throughout the state, I work in multiple states, they're the only medical group that has made that decision. And again, it's just a subset of their primary care team. Okay, it's not, it's like 35, 36 doctors. It's not all of them. Um, and it's not their specialists. So I thought you initially were gonna say that I, my doctor doesn't take Medicare. So if they're saying to you, I only take Medicare Advantage, that's a little different. They're participating in the Medicare system, but yeah, yeah, yeah. That is unique to that practice. It is not a very widespread thing. I, you know, never say never. There's, there's clearly motivations for physicians to encourage people to be in a managed care model, but how widespread it will become. Question from the virtual audience. Yeah, uh, so Alan asks, if I enroll in Medicare, then sometime after I turn 65 and get a job which provides health insurance, does my Medicare coverage end? And can I enroll again after I retire? Um, okay, so great question, but I'm not sure I followed the nuance. So they're already in Medicare prior to age 65, or they, they did become Medicare eligible and chose to be on it. And now they've gotten a job that give, just happens to give them group benefits. Yes, the second The one. latter, okay. Um, you have a choice. You can disenroll in your Medicare Part B, because if you're working and you decide to take the group insurance, and you're still paying for B, your group insurance is gonna pay primary. So you're effectively gonna be paying for Medicare and not using it. Um, it's not super easy to disenroll in part B. The social security office is gonna raise all these white flags because they don't know that you've got a group option, right? So they're gonna throw all these disclaimers at you like you could be penalized and this and that and the other could happen. But it's possible, right? Um, I would encourage you to, you know, sit down with somebody and, and we do this with our with clients all the time who maybe get a group option after the fact, look and see what that really looks like, because you may find that Medicare is a better value, um, particularly if you're the dependent on the plan, you're not the primary insured. The primary insured, the employee is loved by the employer. Their premium is highly subsidized. The spouse, the dependent, they generally are the ones that are about two thirds of the cost. Um, but beyond the cost of the insurance, where Medicare really presents a, a tremendous value vis-a-vis -vis group insurance plans is in the deductibles, the co-pays, the co-insurance. I mean, that's where things can really get discounted when you're in Medicare. So you have options. Um, it's worth a look, but yes, you can unravel your Medicare if you decide you wanna go onto a group plan based on your or your spouse's active work status. And the employer has 20 or more people. Question. So um, there, there isn't, but you can look them up on medicare.gov by, by doc name. Um, you can also call 1-800-MEDICARE if there is specific chiropractic procedures that you're being told by your chiropractor aren't covered by Medicare. And it could be because it's something more, um, more involved than just manual manipulation of the spine. But yeah. Yes, question. Mm-hmm. Great question. I always feel like there's something I forgot to say at the end of all these. Um, the question was, if I'm already taking Social Security and I haven't turned 65 yet, do I have to proactively enroll? No. If you're taking Social Security or railroad retirement benefits, you are going to be automatically enrolled into Medicare. Your card is just going to show up in the mail and it's going to have an effective date for Part A and B the first of the month in which you turn 65. If you don't want your Medicare benefits, Sign the back of the card and send it in. Decline it. 
They may keep your A active, but they won't enroll you in B. Okay. So you can decide you don't want it, but yeah, you're going to be automatically enrolled because this is what happens, folks. If you're taking your benefits, your premiums, that 170.10 per month for Part B, it's just going to be pulled right from your premium. If you, if you aren't taking your benefits, let's say you want to wait till 67, 68, but you want to enroll in Medicare at 65, you're going to be billed for those premiums quarterly. And then once you decide to take your benefits, they're automatically just going to shift you to a monthly draw from your benefit check. Yes. He doesn't have to go online and enroll in part A and B. If he's taking social security, they will go ahead and sign him up. What he will need to decide is, does he wanna choose a Medicare Advantage plan or does he wanna pick up drug coverage and a supplement? So if you're working with me, I'm going to look at a couple things. I'm going to look at the financial rating of the parent company, and I only like A-rated companies. Okay, if it's a, if it's a difference of $3 and it's an A-plus rated company versus a B-plus rated company, I'm going with the A-plus rated company 100% of the time. The second thing I'm looking at is how long have they been in the med sub business? There's about 39 different insurance companies in Illinois that sell Medicare supplement products, right? Some of them have been in the business for a hot minute. They might have a lower, shinier price by five or $10, but guess what? Their risk pool is this big because they haven't been in this market very long. And I'll let some other agent write that business. I want safety and numbers around my clients. And so track record in the business also demonstrates to me that I can look up their rate increase history and I can see if it's averaged in that five to 8% range. Because the other thing I don't want to have happen to you is double digit rate increases every single year between ages 66 and 82. Because guess what? That compounds fast. So financial rating, track record in the business, you know, and so you're going to see all the usual suspects, the big guys bubble to the top. They're very rate competitive with one another in this market. You know, some people come at this um, decision point in life and they've had bad experiences with insurance companies as well. Okay. And I appreciate that. I'm not going to convince you to get one, one carrier over another. That's not my job. My job is to find you value and, and to find you, you know, good, reputable companies. But if you had a really bad experience with one carrier over another, I'm not going to talk you into that. Now, one of the things we always try to do, especially if we're working with a pair, two people coming at the same time is we always look for household discounts. You may find supplements have household discounts. Um, different carriers have different rules. Some will give you household discounts right out of the gate, even if your spouse isn't Medicare eligible yet, but just because you live with them, you'll get a discount. Other carriers require your household member to also get a supplement with their company. You don't have to get the same coverage. One of you could get the G, one could get the N, one could get the high deductible, but you have to be with the same company to trigger the discount. And then there are some companies that if you have group insurance with their company and you stay with them for Medicare, they might give you a discount too. So all of these things vary by carrier, but we'll make sure that we're leveraging that when we're working with you to give you choices. We work with all the companies. And so it doesn't matter to me, but I'm going to filter the 39 down to probably about four or five. Your biggest decision is going to be what coverage on that chart do you want? What makes you feel comfortable that you have enough insurance? And then I'll shop, you know, we'll help you shop for the best price. Question? The financial ratings of the parent company? I mean, that's hard to say because I don't really know how AM Best and S&P reevaluate and when they do that. Um, but generally, you don't see much fluctuation in that. Um, you do see minimal fluctuation in the star ratings that Medicare gives um, D plans and C plans because those are redone every year. Mm -hmm. 
question was, when do I get the party started, right? When do I start thinking about this? And my answer to people always is when your heart starts to race, okay? When your blood pressure goes up and you start to feel anxious about this, even if it's a year from now or six months ahead of your, we should talk. Because I want you to feel confident that you can kind of chunk this down into manageable steps. I wouldn't, if you're coming off of a group plan I, and, and you've de delayed on your um, part B, so you're coming under a special enrollment, I would give yourself at least 90 days ahead of when you want that coverage to start because part B can only start on the first of a month. Depending on your retirement date, you know, your group benefits may last for the, that whole entire month, right? Even if you retire on the second or the third of the month. And so you're going to need a second form from your employer that says, this is where I've been since I turned 65 and this is the coverage I've, I have. It's a special Centers for Medicare and Medicaid form. That has to go with your Part B application. If you don't send it in with that, your Part B, it's just going to sit pending because if you're not during the annual enrollment or the, the first quarter of the year, um, they're, gonna, they're not going to process you, right? They, they need to know that that form shows them you have a special reason to come to Medicare now when you want to um, and that you shouldn't be calculated a late enrollment penalty. So sometimes I've seen employers sit on those forms. So give them some time to fill that form and get it back, back to you because you want to have it in hand when you sit down at your computer to do your enrollment for Part B. If you're, if you're coming to Medicare when you turn 65, you know you can start, your, your open enrollment window starts three months before your 65th birthday month. If you try to go into the social security system and enroll before that, it's not going to let you in. Okay, so you, you definitely have to be in the beginning of your window if you want your benefits to start the first of that month. But if you're coming on a deferred basis, you know, 60 to 90 days. I mean, I, right now I'm working with people that are going effective in July. But that's, you know, but then I'll have people that are going effective July 1st that'll call me on June 15th. I mean, the, the thing that takes the longest is Medicare. It takes at least four weeks for your application to process. They're just going to send you the card. So the minute you have your Medicare number, you have all you need to choose your other things and get enrolled. So I don't have to apply for Part B or anything? No. Because I'm already Correct, yeah. Uh-huh. So generally, any insurance company, whether it's a group plan, a marketplace plan, whatever it is, they're generally not going to take your termination of coverage until you've paid your last month's premium. So the month your policy, you're going to want your policy to effectively end because you're going on to Medicare the first of the next month. That's when you should call them. But I wouldn't call to terminate any coverage under any circumstance until you know that your Medicare has processed. You have your card, you have your number. Because that piece is the piece that can go sideways on people. All this other stuff that you would work with a broker like me on, that stuff can happen really quickly. But you can't apply for anything, not a supplement, not a drug plan, not an Advantage plan, unless you have a Medicare number. And a Medicare number will not be issued to you until your Medicare application has processed or until they've processed you because you're taking your benefits already. You know, it varies. I've seen people get it at the, at the front end of their initial enrollment window, and then I've seen people get it a month ahead of their birthday month. So it just depends on how busy the local social security office is. I would call if you don't see it at least the month before. You might even see it earlier. Yeah. Virtual question. Yeah, uh, Sarah asks, if I stay with the same supplement insurance provider, but want to go from one plan to another, maybe F to C, does that go through an underwriting process? It does if you're out of that initial enrollment window. Although in the state of Illinois, the governor passed legislation that went into effect in January of this year. That's called the birthday rule, where 45 days around your birthday in our state, you can now make a plan change that is of equivalent or, or lower, I believe, um, within the same company. Um, but it has to be the same, exact same product. Like the, 
So sometimes there's different products over the years within the same carrier. So it's gotta be, you've gotta be going from the same to the same, just different plans. And you can only do it 45 days around your birthday. You're welcome, thanks for coming. Any other question? One more question. Well, um, you know, so, so it's a little bit around funding, right? So how you get paid, how, how providers will get paid for patients that are on Medicare Advantage is on a per person basis. Whether you come through the door to get care or not, they're going to get a flat amount per patient on Medicare Advantage. Um, in Medicare, you have to come through the door, get care, they have to bill Medicare, and then they get reimbursed. Okay, so that's part of it. But the other part of it is doctors like managed care, because if your insurance is keeping you within a certain medical group, because that's how your insurance is structured, you're more likely to stay within that medical group for your care than going off to get care somewhere else, right? So a little bit of it is, is an incentive to keep you within the practice for all your specialty care, you know? So it, there's kind of some financial incentive there, but also incentive to keep you within the practice. Okay. Thank you everyone for your wonderful questions. Thank you to the virtual audience for hanging on. I appreciate everyone's time and attention. And if you need any help, feel free to contact me. There's never any fee to get our, to me. Nope, no consult. And the cost of the products are exactly the same whether you go direct to the insurance company or you work with us.